Hi, I'm retired NYPD Detective Vic Ferrari, and welcome to NYPD Through the Looking Glass, where you'll get unique insight into the New York City Police Department. Before we get started, I encourage you to check out my Amazon author page where you'll find my series of behind-the-scenes NYPD books. They're $10 paperback, $2.99 ebook download, including my bestseller, NYPD Laughing in the Line of Duty. So I hope everyone's having a great week. Um, I have a really interesting story from my days working as a detective in the NYPD's auto crime division about a case by I was involved in. But before we get to that, I'd like to talk about a little bit about what's going on in New York City and current events. And growing up in New York, before the internet, my family always used to have a couple of newspapers delivered to the house. And from what I can remember, we got at least the New York Daily News and the New York Post. And... The New York Post, I still read it online digitally down here in Florida. And the, the thing about the New York Post is, I mean, they're funny. They've got a good sense of humor, and their headlines just kind of like grab your attention. And if you're doing something stupid in New York, the New York Post is going to let you have it with both barrels. So the other day, I'm looking at the Post online, and a story that jumped out at me is a bunch of illegal aliens char charged Bloomingdale's and ran out of there with $5,300 worth of sunglasses. Now, I didn't know sunglasses were that expensive, and from what, it, from what I read, it was like a gang of them ran in there, just started grabbing things off the display counter and took off, and I think an NYPD cop apprehended one of them, which, I mean, good luck with that, because you're going to fingerprint the guy. His prints are going to come back to nobody from nothing, because he's from another country. They're going to let him out on no bail, and he's going to do it all over again. I just don't understand New York City's mindset being a sanctuary city. I mean, I really don't like getting into politics, but you're going to bring a couple of hundred thousand people with nothing to do and just kind of leave them in, in Manhattan in the five boroughs. I mean, what could go wrong? And apparently it is. And, you know, I feel bad for the hardworking people in New York City who pay taxes and have to put up with this nonsense. But that's kind of one of the, one of the reasons I left. Another story that jumped out at me from the New York Post is, and you can't make this stuff up, is there's a detective assigned to the police commissioner's office, and she was arrested for allegedly stealing $160 worth of merchandise in a uh, home improvement store in Suffolk County, New York. So <laughs> the police commissioner's office, what they do is they have detectives assigned there, and sometimes they're bodyguards for the police commissioner and their family. They chauffeur them around. They do the advance, so if the police commissioner is going to speak somewhere, they'll have somebody there first. They'll drive up with them. They're basically bodyguards, and, and a lot of them do like public relations things or paperwork or scheduling. So they've got a team of people working for them in the police commissioner's office. But to get into these specialized units like that, you've got to know somebody. It's just not like one day the police commissioner is going to walk by and go, hey, you look like a good guy. You look like a good gal. You know what? I'm going to throw you in the police commissioner's office. Doesn't work with that way. More than likely, I'm guessing, the police commissioner or someone close to the police commissioner knew this person and said, you know, she'd be a good fit. Or maybe she was in there before, but it, it usually the new administration usually brings in people close to them they can trust, and they've known them along their way in the NYPD. That's just the way it worked. Um, when I was in the auto crime division, we had a detective in my office who had served previous to coming to our office. He worked for, he was in the PC's office, and his job was to, he was a bodyguard for, uh, I believe it was Ray Kelly's family. I think his wife, he was like the chauffeur to make sure, you know, everything was fine with her. But anyway, this female cop, from what I'm reading in the New York Post, she's 54 years old, so she's got considerable time inside the NYPD. And, I mean, if this is true, she just basically threw away her career. And I hate to put people's money out there, but according to the New York Post report, she's making over $150,000 a year. So, I mean, if this is true, it's a stupid move. But there are three sides to every story. There's what he said, what she said, and what really happened. And I've seen this with shoplifting cases with NYPD members. I've seen both sides of it. So when I was a rookie cop, there was a guy in my precinct. He lived in Orange County, and uh, he went into a home improvement store. I don't remember which one it was. And as he's exiting, he's with a small child, and as he's exiting, he gets grabbed by store security, and they say, you didn't pay for something. He goes, well, what are you talking about? Of course I paid for something, everything. And they said, no, 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 open your bag. And 
there was a paintbrush inside the bag and he didn't he didn't get charged for it. I mean, it was like a dollar paintbrush. I mean, we were talking 30 something years ago. But what had happened was his son, he his small kid, which was like three or four years old, just was walking around with a paintbrush in his hand and just threw it into the bag and afterwards and he got grabbed for it. So I guess he got a little pissed off at the security. Words were exchanged. Next thing you know, he goes into the loss prevention office. They call the local cops and he gets arrested and they subpoenaed. Luckily for him, they did have, I mean, back then it was probably like the old antiquated CCT um, security system, but they subpoenaed it immediately and what it showed was the small child was walking around with a paintbrush. He wasn't paying attention. It was a buck. And the kid just tossed it in the bag after he had paid for everything. And that's how we got grabbed. On the other side of the coin, um, early in my career, there was a female cop in a precinct that I knew a little bit, didn't know her well. And actually, I mean, she had family on the job. Her dad was a lieutenant. So, I mean, she knew how the NYPD worked. And as a young female cop, I mean, you know, very... Nice girl, very popular. Everybody liked her. And um, I forget where she lived, but it it wasn't in the five boroughs. And she gets grabbed for shoplifting. And it's a big to-do, but the store didn't want to press charges. So the department um, waived giving her department charges. They gave her the benefit of the doubt, and it kind of went away. Well, a couple of months later, it happens again. And... This time they've got surveillance footage and I guess someone followed her. So they they had an eyewitness account and surveillance footage. So they put her what's called on modified assignment. And at the time she was a rookie cop. So when when you're a rookie, your first two years in my time, it might be longer now, but your probationary period was two years. So basically she was going to get fired um, pending a department hearing. But while she's kind of in this limbo on modified assignment, she gets arrested again for shoplifting. So it was obvious she had a problem. Maybe she was a kleptomaniac. I don't know. But I do know that, you know, she was a really nice girl, but she lost her job. I mean, what are the odds of someone getting arrested three times for shoplifting within six months? Just doesn't happen. So obviously she had some kind of problem. I hope she, you know, whatever it was. She got it taken care of. But yeah, I mean, there's three sides to every story. I hate to say that this female cop um, shoplifted this stuff out in Suffolk County. But at her age, I mean, you're old enough to know better. Let's just hope it's not true. And there's video footage that says that claim that shows that she didn't do it, but you never know. But it's an embarrassment for the police commissioner's office in a black eye. And from the, the third story I want to cover in the world of cover events is from the world of you can't make this up. And you got to look this up because and not take, just take my word for it. But there was a um, a synagogue in Brooklyn, and you had this renegade. Uh, well, I wouldn't want to call him renegade, but you've got this uh, these Hasidic this a Hasidic church called Chabad Lubavitch Hasidic movement, and they were found to be digging tunnels beneath New York City streets that were popping up into the street and didn't have permits for anything of this. It's kind of like something out of the Shawshank Redemption. It was kind of discovered by accident. And the tunnels were three foot high, 20 feet wide, and 50 foot long tunnels using crude instruments, including their hands. They stuffed dirt into their pockets so their late work wouldn't be detected by the sex leaders and wider community. So it sounds like these guys were doing it on the sneak, that the Grand Rebbe or Rabbi didn't know about this. But I mean, it's a bizarre story for people digging tunnels beneath uh, a synagogue popping up in the New York City streets. I just found that story fascinating. So just go on the New York Post and look up these stories because it's pretty interesting stuff. So that brings us to today's story. Uh, When I got to the auto crime division, I was paired up with this detective. His partner had just moved on to another unit. Great guy. was a Manhattan guy. I was a Bronx guy. So I knew a lot about the Bronx. He knew a lot about Manhattan. And with him came an informant. And he had this confidential informant we used to call the weatherman. And the way he obtained this uh, confidential informant was 13, 14 years earlier, my partner is a rookie cop. He's working in the Washington Heights section of Manhattan, and he's got a foot post. And the Washington Heights section of Manhattan at the time, and probably still, you had a large Dominican, Dominican community, people from the Dominican Republic that had settled in that neighborhood. 
And it was a busy precinct. The, the three four precinct uh, in the late seventies, early eighties led New York City in homicides. They averaged over a hundred homicides a year. Later on, when I worked there in narcotics, I mean, you, you just couldn't go anywhere with bumping into drugs. So it was a very violent, very busy precinct. So anyway, my partner at the time is this rookie cop, and he gets a foot post, and he's chasing guys off the corner that are selling drugs. And he knows this guy, the weatherman. And, you know, he knows that he's a drug dealer and he's busting his balls, making a move off the corner. So one day he spots this guy putting a baggie or something into his pants. So he says, come here. The guy takes off. He chases him into a building. This guy is a lot more athletic than my old partner. The guy gets up several flights of steps. As my partner, my partner calls the 1013 officer needs assistance. He's in pursuit. He gets up. He gets up to about he catches he catches this guy like on the sixth floor tosses him he's got nothing one of the cops responding into the hallway comes running up the stairs and he finds a bag with like an ounce or a half ounce of coke it was powder right? that much i remember my partner telling me that so he walks up to him with this bag of coke and he goes this yours no it's not mine and he goes all right he says i'll tell you what you owe me he says i'm not going to say that i saw you drop this he says you owe me and the guy nodded his head he goes all right so my partner went back to the precinct. He vouched the cocaine is found property. Never gave it a second thought. So 10, 12 years later, he's a detective in the auto crime division. Him and his partner are driving around and they're getting something to eat up in the heights. And this guy comes up to him and he goes, do you remember me? And he goes, oh, yeah, yeah. How you doing? And he goes, oh, I'm doing good. I turned my, I went to jail for a while. I turned my life around. And my old partner's looking at him like, yeah, okay. He knows he's still a player. So they make small talk, and he says, listen, you know, I appreciate what you did for me 10 years ago. And my partner said, yeah, all right, well, listen. He reaches into his pocket, and he hands him a card with his phone number, and it says, you know, Detective Auto Crime Division. He goes, listen, he goes, do you ever want to talk if you got information? He goes, yeah, yeah, okay. And he takes the card, just kind of blowing him off. So they go their separate ways. Uh, about a week or two later, the guy is riding on the back of a stolen motorcycle in lower Manhattan. He gets grabbed by the police. He's on probation or parole. I think it was parole for drug sales. So now he's in jail. So through his attorney, he contacts my old partner. My old partner goes down to court. They have what's called queen for a day. Queen for a day is if you're in jail or you're a defendant in a case and you want to give information, what they do is it's called queen for a day. You come in with your attorney, a district attorney is going to be there, and there's you know someone, a representative of law enforcement. They're going to hear what you have to say. And anything short of murder can't be used against you in a court of law. Might open up a case on somebody else, but they can't use it against you unless it's, it's a homicide. So anyway, he tells my partner he knows all these things about auto theft and all, all this crazy stuff in Washington Heights. And my partner said, you know, if half of what he's telling me in this proffer session is true. He'd make a really good informant. So he signs him up and he's working with him. And now here I come along a couple of years after he's already has this guy established and he's working for him. So, I mean, there's so many stories I could go into with this guy as far as what he gave us. Um, I'll do that on another episode, but just to kind of give you an idea. Um, one time he gave us five kilos in a trap in a, in, in a car that was heading up to Rhode Island. Another time, he gave us a Toyota pickup truck that had several guns in it um, that was stashed away inside the truck, and it was going to be shipped to the Dominican Republic. And a famous story uh, with him is he gave us uh, a guy who had stolen Mike Tyson's Ducati and, and other motorcycles, and they were going to ship it to the Dominican Republic before we arrested the gang. So this guy was very prolific. He, he gave us a ton of stuff. It's kind of sad what happened to him in the end. Maybe one day I'll, I'll do an entire episode about him. i got to remember all the stories to kind of put it together because I, I wouldn't be doing him justice if I just kind of give half-assed stories. So anyway, my lieutenant wanted... This is around 1999. Yeah, it was probably around probably early fall of 1999. And my lieutenant, he was one of these guys, he always wanted a case going. Now, cases are great because, you know, you're building up a case, you're going on wiretaps, you're gaining a lot of information, and then when you take it down, you scoop up all these bad guys, right? You get a press conference. But guess what? These cases take time. A lot of times they need funding. And while you're working on these cases, arrests aren't coming in, right? So while you're working on this big case and, you know, 
watching bad guys burn cars or steal cars or ship cars out of the country. While that's going on, your numbers are going up. And these precinct commanders are crying to one police plaza like, you know, what is auto crime doing or what is narcotics doing? My numbers are going through the roof. Well, you know, now they want you to stop what you're doing and turn around and start picking off car thieves. Or if you're, if you're in the narcotics division and you're working on a big case, now they want you to stop what you're doing with this major case and then do buy and bust and run around and send out your undercovers and start buying drugs for making street level buys and locking people up just so you can say, yeah, I'm doing something. So it's kind of a slippery slope when you work in the organized crime division because they want their numbers. They get addicted to the numbers, especially after Comstat came to play inside the New York City Police Department, which that's a story for another day. But so they want it both ways. So anyway, my lieutenant wants this case and he tells my um, my partner, he says, listen, you've got that informant. He goes, I, I want you guys to st start up a case. He goes, this is great. You guys are picking guys off, but I want a major case. We said, all right. So our informant tells us he's got a guy. He's a prolific car thief. His name his nickname was Giovanni. And Giovanni would go around Manhattan and he would steal high-end BMWs and Mercedes. He was shipping some of them out of the country. Some of the cars were getting sold to chop shops and other cars. What they were doing was changing the vehicle identification numbers on the cars. So while we're working that angle, there's another detect. So my office, you had the Bronx team and the Manhattan team. While, while we're starting, starting up this case, going to target Giovanni, a detective in the Bronx team, has has an informant and he's got guys that are stealing cars and they're actually and they also know people that don't want their cars anymore so it's called an insurance job so say for argument's sake you get in over your head on a car payment or a lease and you know when you return that lease that you're over the miles and your kid threw up in the back seat so you're going to get dinged you're going to return that car and they're going to hit you with fees three four thousand dollars right so it's easier to make the car disappear and call and say, listen, I don't know what happened. You call the insurance company. The insurance company steps in, cuts them a check. So we had an, so the Bronx team had an informant that knew guys that wanted to get rid of their cars. So we kind of did a two-pronged case. You had the Manhattan team, which was going to work with our informant, codenamed the Weatherman. And then the Bronx team had a separate informant that was going to give them insurance fraud cases. And we were going to use the same undercover detective that was going to work in the Bronx in Manhattan. So what we did was we had our informant introduce our undercover detective to Giovanni. And they hit it off. They started goofing around, you know, blah, 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 blah. We got funding from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. And soon we were buying high-end um, BMWs and Mercedes for about $5,000 a piece. So what we did was... There's a, a, a Pathmark parking lot in uh, the Washington Heights section of, no, not Washington Heights, the Inwood section of Manhattan. It's on West 207th Street, right off the Major Deegan Expressway. And that place is a den of iniquity. I've got so many stories of just walking into big arrests in that parking lot. But anyway, in that, what we did was about two hours before we were going to make a buy off of Giovanni, before he delivered us a stolen car, what we would do is we would have a surveillance van get there an hour or two before. It looked like a plumbing truck. It had PVC pipe on the sides. On, on the roof, it had like a vent that would pop up with a periscope so we could film the buys. So we had two detectives sitting in that van. They'd get there about two hours earlier. We would park around the perimeter of the parking lot several blocks off set with binoculars. The undercover would get there. We told him where the surveillance van would be. So he would try to park near or get dropped off near that surveillance van so he could really kind of direct where Giovanni was going to be. First two buys go great. Giovanni shows up with one of his buddies with a high-end car. Our undercover pretends like he shows up. There were two undercovers, but one stays in the car. Our main undercover gets out, looks at the car, kicks the tires. They go inside the car. He gives Giovanni $5,000. Jo uh, Giovanni counts it out. Giovanni gets out of the car. He gets in another car with one of his buddies, and they go their separate ways. So the first two or three buys, not a problem in the world. Um... Then the Bronx guys were delivering stolen cars in the meantime to, to the same undercover. So one day, probably the fourth buy, I think it was, Giovanni shows up and um, buy goes great. Our undercover gets inside the stolen vehicle. And as he's leaving the parking lot, he gets on his Kel, which is a hidden microphone that transmits to us. And he goes, 
He goes, Giovanni's raised up. Something's not right. I can just tell the way he's looking around. He goes, he might have spotted somebody or something. He goes, but something's not right. We said, all right. So I got on the radio, and, and as I'm just about to get on the radio, I see Giovanni and his buddy, and they start walking towards our surveillance van. So I'm like, oh, shit. So I get on the radio, and I tell our two detectives that are hiding inside the surveillance van. They're not, like, sitting in the front. They're in the, in the back of the van. And I get on the radio. I says, listen, something's not right. Giovanni and his buddy are going over the van. I go, Make sure it's not running. That's A. And B, don't make a sound in there. Lower your radios. So we're watching from about a block away. And Giovanni and his buddy, they're staring in the back window. They're looking through the front window. They're rocking the van. They're, like, pulling on the doors. They know something's not right. They leave. They get, they get in their car, and they take off. So now we're like, what are we going to do? We can't, our undercover was only calling Giovanni a day or two before and saying, hey, you, 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 what do you got for me? And Giovanni goes, oh, I got a 5 Series or I got a Mercedes. So for him to call him the next day or a couple hours later would really, like, raise him up. Now, why is this guy calling me? He only calls me, like, every week, every other week just to see what, I, you know, what, what my inventory is. So we didn't want to do that. We didn't want to expose the undercover. So what we did was the following day we called up the weatherman, our undercover, and we said, listen, do us a favor, you know, either call him or go by his base of operations where he hangs out and just find out, you know, because you made the introduction, see what he says. So our undercover gets back to us. He goes, it's not around. N nobody knows where he is. I'm like, oh, shit. So a day or two later, the undercover calls up and he goes, he goes, he's in the Dominican Republic. I said, you got to be kidding us. He goes, no. He goes, he, he's almost certain that that police, that, that van that you guys had in there was a police van. He got, he got skidded, you know, skittish. He took off. I says, well, you know, is he coming back? He goes, I'm not sure. He says, um, it's not going to be for a while. He certainly wants to, you know, uh, find out if, if you guys were the police. He's just, he's definitely going to lay low for a while. So a couple of months went by and Giovanni is not coming back and we've got all these stolen cars from our case and then the Bronx end of it, you know, people want a press conference. People, you know, we figure, well, the worst that'll happen is he'll be a fugitive and when he comes back, we'll grab him. So the, the, the decision was made to take down the case and there were a bunch of arrests made from the Bronx angle of the case. And in addition to buying several stolen cars from the Bronx faction, um, our undercover actually was in, was introduced to another guy who we purchased a couple of guns off. Of, so that's great to take a couple of guns off the street. So I think in total, it was $450,000 worth of stolen vehicles recovered. And the funny thing about that story is, about a month after the press conference and everything, somebody calls Giovanni and says, hey, you know, you're in the newspaper. The auto crime division's looking for you. Giovanni said, well, I'm not coming back, and I'm going to dental school in the Dominican Republic. So I thought that was the funniest thing in the world, that this here we are with this press conference, and, you know, his, his picture and name is all over the newspaper, and he's going to dental school in a third-world country. So, again, you can't make this stuff up as far as what goes on inside the New York City Police Department. And like I said, I will do another episode about the weatherman. Again, he's got so many great stories, I mean, about this guy. I got to call my old partner up and see if I, you know what, that would be good if I could get him to come on and talk about him because we could go on and on and on about this guy. But uh, he's no longer active. We don't even really know if he's alive anymore. And that's actually part of the story. Another thing I'd like to talk about is... We got the playoffs coming up, so I'm going to do what's called VIX picks. So we've got Cleveland at Houston. I'm going to go with the grizzled old veteran Joe Flacco and give two and a half points. I'm also going to take the Chiefs and give four against the Dolphins. I think the Dolphins are too banged up. I'm going to take Buffalo and give ten at the with the Steelers because I think with that with T.J. Watt out. They're not going to be able to do anything. A surprise game. I'm going to take. I'm going to take the Packers in seven and a half. I think they've got a chance. And Mike McCarthy is looking over his shoulder because Jimmy Jones is probably going to replace him now that Bill Belichick is out in New England. I'm going to take Detroit and give three and a half with the Rams. I think the Lions can make a lot of noise in the playoffs. And I'm going to take the Eagles and give two and a half to Tampa Bay, even though I don't think. 
I don't think that the Philadelphia is going to go any too deep into the playoffs, but Tampa Bay is really banged up, and I just don't think Baker Mayfield with all these injuries is going to be able to pull out a win. So as always, I want to thank everyone for tuning in, especially my listeners in Grady, Alabama, Nyack, New York, San Antonio, Texas, which I love San Antonio, love the Riverwalk, great place, great food. If you ever get a chance and you're in Texas, stop by San Antonio. Cherry Hill, New Jersey. I actually stayed at the Hilton there once. And Putnam Valley, New York. If you work in law enforcement or have an cr- interesting criminal background and would like to be a guest on the show, reach out to me on Twitter or Instagram, at VicFerrari50. I'm, I'm guessing that's why I'm getting all these new followers who I don't know, uh, either that or they're bots. And if you enjoy the content, again, please check out my Amazon author page. Type in my name, Vic. Ferrari Like the Car, where you can preview all my books for free, including NYPD Law and Disorder. Oh, and The Weatherman. If you want to know more about The Weatherman and that informant and some of the things he's, you know, he got us, check out my book, Grand Theft Auto, the NYPD's Auto Crime Division. It's everything about the auto theft industry, chop shops, exporting stolen cars out of the country, tagging, changing VIN numbers on cars, sophisticated, sophisticated car theft rings. And again, there's an entire chapter about the weatherman in there. And I mean, the guy, we just couldn't keep up with him. It got to the point, he was giving us so many cases and so many arrests that my partner and I were at our desk trying to close out these cases. And he would call us up and say, hey, I got a guy that's going to steal a car. Or, hey, I got a guy. Actually, you know what? I'll tell you a quick story. One more quick story about Giovanni. So when we took that case down and Giovanni's now in the wind, the weatherman tells us that Giovanni's girlfriend, who he's no longer with, has a Honda that's stolen that the VIN number was changed. And she lives out in Queens somewhere. So we get the plate, and I keep driving by the house. And another guy I was working with at the time says, why don't you just knock on the door? I says, I don't want to spook them. He goes, no, 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 knock on the door. See if she's around, right? I knock on the door, and the parents know what's up. They know there's something up with that car. The next thing, you know, the car is nowhere to be found. And she surrenders the plates in New York. So now I'm like, shit, they probably made the car disappear because they know I'm looking for it, right? I'm running the plate. I'm running the plate. I'm running the VIN. About three months later, the car comes back registered in Idaho. Idaho? How the fuck did the car get out in Idaho? But it was out in Idaho, right? So I had all the paperwork on this car. The phony VIN number that was on it, that car was burned. So the car was, the car was a total loss. It was burned in a fire. Someone bought it at auction for pennies on the dollar like the shell, took the VIN history off that car, slapped it on a stolen car from Queens, and registered it. Well, she had the car for a while. She was Giovanni's girlfriend. He probably told her to get rid of it. She was in the military at the time, so she traded in a car dealership in Idaho, and the car dealership in Idaho sells the car to some poor unsuspecting person, right? So I call up... I think it was Idaho Department of Motor Vehicles or somebody in Idaho. And I tell them about this car. So they go, oh, yeah, we we do that with confidential VIN numbers and hidden VIN numbers on cars. He goes, the car is about an hour away. (laughs) Because, I mean, you know, Idaho is a large state and there's not a lot of people there. He goes, I'll I'll go take a look at it. So a couple of weeks later, the guy calls me back and he says, "Um, no, I checked out the car. It's fine. I said, it's not fine. I says, um... I says, you have to look at the engine number. you got to look at the firewall. I says, these guys are like Swiss watchmakers. They, they change everything. So the guy goes, well, you know that car is about an hour away. I says, I would greatly appreciate it. And I sent him the paperwork of the, uh, photos of the burnt car from the insurance company. He goes, all right, I'll get back to you. About a week later, he goes, I couldn't believe it. The car is stolen from Queens. I said, yep, sure is. So Giovanni might have gotten away, but we picked off his girlfriend's car. So anyway, thank you for tuning in. I'll have another episode out next week. And thanks again.